Hi, I'm Dave Richards. Welcome to another old steam power machine shop. This is episode number 39, uh, and this is the shop that we targeted at 1925, and we do things with steam power uh, by line shaft, with the exception of a few small pieces of equipment here, which we are slowly converting over as we have time. Uh, Power is supplied by 193 Richards Iron Works engine built in Manitowoc, Wisconsin. Uh, line shafts uh, are from here, there, and everywhere. So, uh, in this episode, I'll tell you, no sooner in the last episode did I decide to cast up a whole new oversized piston for the Morris here. Then I figured, well, if the piston is scrap, I'm going to mess around with it. So uh, I put it on the rod and put it on the lathe, lined it up, machined it down, and tried brazing it up with brass rod. And I figured, eh, might as well video it as long as I'm doing it. About halfway through the process, I realized this is going to work pretty good. So that's the way I did it, and uh, that's what this video is concerned with. Uh, got a few other little things to show you, uh, you might be interested in, and uh, we'll get right to work on it. Thanks a lot, by the way, for all of the uh, subscri <laughs> subscriptions and uh, likes and uh, comments. Uh, this is, this channel is really an educational channel for you guys. And if you have any questions or comments, please put them on the comments. Um, so without any further yakking, we'll get right to work on it. I've got it turned down to within about an eighth of an inch of where it's going to need to be and uh, I just keep filling in the low spots building up the edges
course this being cast iron requires preheating and a lot of heat to get the to get the bronze laid down on there but once you've got it on there it's pretty easy to build it up in spots without heating the whole piece up because all you're doing is just fusing into the brass that melts at a lower temperature and so I think I'm way up above six. I'm gonna try it. I'm gonna try turning it and see how it cleans up. off of this rod because it's not really needed. I'm just adding more brass to the deposit that I put on there before to build it up a little. And I'm not having to heat it up nearly as much as I did in order to graze it on there in the first place. Just touching up the low spots here. I got my final patchwork on the brass buildup done here. I'm cleaning up the inside of the ring groove. Uh, I took the outside part of the piston off and uh, 
I'm not going to go all the way on this. I'm just going to sort of uh, rough machine and leave about a hundred thousandths on the on the OD uh, because I want to take a little off of this surface and bolt the piston together and put it on the new rod that I made before here and uh, put a center hole in here and set the whole thing up between centers uh, on the other lathe and then machine this so that everything will be perfectly straight and concentric with the piston and the connecting rod. That's how they did it in the locomotive shops. Uh, when they did any work on a piston it was complete with the rod and everything was straight that way. I mounted my little lathe on electricity this morning. I've got the boiler apart for cleaning. And I have it in the lowest speed with the belt in the back here. I went to a carbide tool here uh, because there's hard spots along the edge of the cast iron that got overheated uh, a little bit when I was putting on the brass. So uh, high speed tool just disintegrates when it hits those. This is the crosshead end of the piston rod for the Morris engine. I'm going to thread it. It's got to be, uh, it's got to start at two and an eighth. Set this up with a thread gauge. Okay, the compound is set at 30 degrees. I'm going to feed it in at 30 degrees. setting it up on the back here so I'll disengage this which is a sliding dog that locks the pulley to the spindle so when I slide that down tighten it back up so it won't go anywhere and this can spin free and I'll engage here so now it's in low range. this up for nine threads per inch and uh, there's two ranges on this. Uh, this top half is with the 62 gear on the stud and the 32 on the box down here. And you can get more uh, different teeth 
numbers by switching them around. Put the 60 up here, the 30 down there. Uh, and so that's what these two ranges are for, split in half. Right now we got the 30 on the, on the uh, 60 on the box and the 30 on the stuff. So we're on the bottom half of that. And a lot of thread pitches appear on both ranges. So we're looking for a nine, and that's it right there. Nine threads per inch, or if you're using the feed part of the system, it's 36 thousand per revolution feed. So we're not going to we're going to have that disengaged and running off the, the uh, feed speed. So we have nine threads per inch here. So you follow this column down here, and you put the lever over here in this notch. And then you also have to have the lever selection in B and C. This one up here is on B, that one's on C. So, we should be uh, set up for nine threads per inch. So we'll make a little test cut and see. shifted the back gear down into really low back gear, so it's going really slow for the first couple passes so we can see where we're at. Uh, this is the plate that explains the threading, the threading dial. I think I showed you this before in one of the other videos, but it says, for even threads engage half nut at any line. For odd threads, every quarter revolution. Half threads every half revolution, quarter threads every full revolution. So we can uh, engage um, every quarter revolution. So if you look at that thread dial here, of course that this holds true with any lathe that has a four inch dial. That is a dial that makes one revolution per four inches of the carriage. So I can engage on any number. With, according to this, or any half number. And I'm going to stick with the numbers just so I'll remember what I'm doing. So I can engage on any number, one, two, three, or four. I never really knew where this thing went. I got this lathe completely disassembled, and I never could find anything that lined up with these rivet holes. It might have been on a cover over the top that's gone now. Okay. So, I want to make this a little bit stop. Just bring the tool down so I feel a touch. Move it over here out of the way. Give it another couple of thousands. And it lines right up on the zero for some strange reason. So that's my reference mark on the cross line. Okay. Try and get this so you can see the thread dial. This is like life in a really slow way, not like Adam Booth. These threads are about 400 RPM.
finished thread job here uh, I had several catastrophes in the process of threading this well not really catastrophes but for one thing <clears throat> I had some visitors in the shop and uh, interfered with my filming this for you but uh, the other thing was I forgot uh, Tom and I had made this one inch and uh, cut down the ends to seven eighths. So I had to wipe the threads off, clean this down to seven eighths, and start over again. But it turned out good. Um, the other thing is, uh, when I was test fitting this piece under the threads on the last couple of cuts, I uh, was screwing this on and it was tight and it skidded this in the chuck which really screws things up because then it throws the lathe out of index with your threads but I was almost there so <clears throat> I took it out of the lathe and finished it with a die I have a adjustable uh, 7 8 little wonder die and ran that down on there three or four times until this would just spin on nice and this is the nut that Tom cut down for the jam nut here uh, on the piston end uh, what we'll do now is uh, final tighten this and I think I'll put a pin through here uh, through the boss under this uh, just a roll or a uh, tapered pin driven in there and then this uh, end part of the piston will slide over that boss and so the pin if it ever did get loose can't get anywhere 
<clears throat> and that'll secure the piston to the rod. And then we'll put it in the lathe and turn it between centers and finish uh, turning the OD of the piston down to fit the cylinder with about 10 thousandths clearance and then we will move on to making the rings. The deal with the rings is I called three ring specialty manufacturers that are supposed to be making rings for hit and miss engines and steam engines and none of the three even had the courtesy to return my call or email. So as usual I'll make them myself. I'd like to show you this little steam pump. This thing has been kicking around the shop for a long time and uh, I never ran it on steam and so I partly disassembled it and uh, cleaned everything up, made some new gaskets for it here and uh, adjusted the valve up and I'm gonna, I got it piped up and uh, I'm gonna, gonna run it on steam. Uh, this pump I'm assuming to be in operating condition because I know where it came from. Uh, it was in a milk processing plant probably about a mile from here that was scrapped out in the 60s, early 60s and this was rescued from the scrap and uh, so it was built by a Union Steam Pump Company uh, in Battle Creek, Michigan and I would say probably about 1920. It's hard to say because they made them for years and years and didn't change them. And I'm going to bring the camera in here a little closer so you can see. Now the idea is, <clears throat> it's a little like a steam engine on this end. It's got two cylinders and then over on this end is the pump. It's two separate pumps. And they made, them, they made pumps as single cylinder pumps and this is called a duplex pump and it's a lot simpler design because with a single cylinder uh, the, you have to change the valving as it gets to one end so that it will do, the steam will run it to the other end and it gets kind of complicated so that it doesn't stop in the middle of of changing the valving and I never understood how they could work in the first place but they do they work pretty neat uh, they were used for feed water pumps uh, or just to move things around uh, the duplex pump is a little different because it uses the the action of the plunger on one side to actually actuate the valving for the other side so it never gets stuck and uh, it's kind of a clever design um, like I say you can use it as a boiler feed pump you can pump a higher pressure than the steam that's using to drive it because <clears throat> the steam cylinders are bigger than the water cylinders in other words, the area of the piston on the steam side is larger than the area of the piston on the water side. So hydraulically it works out in a ratio of those two different areas. Uh, for instance, if you had twice the area on the steam side than you do on the water side, you'd be able to double, you'd be able to double the pressure. So the only problem with using a a steam pump or a mechanical pump to feed a boiler is that you're putting cold water into a hot working boiler and it pulls the steam pressure down so much and it's rough on the boiler with all the thermal uh, differences there with the cold water and the hot steam. So when you're using a pump to feed a boiler you, you would have to usually use a, a feed water heater which is not a complicated thing usually they just run the exhaust from an engine through a tank and heat the water up uh, it's under pressure because pumps will not pump hot 
water. Neither will injectors work with hot water. So you actually have to heat the water up after it goes through the pump, somewhere between the pump and the boiler. Anyway, it's a little more complicated. I didn't really have a use for this, uh, but I want to get it running anyway. So I piped it up, and I think if I increase the size uh, of my rainwater collection system out here, uh, I'll use it to pump water from a uh, from another collection tank into my feed water barrels here. The way I'm using an ejector now to pump uh, to siphon water from the tank that I have. Um, this over on this end uh, is a lubricator and it's a little smaller version of almost the same thing I have on this engine here, the ONS engine. And it uh, it's called a hyd hydrostatic or a displacement type lubricator. Uh, the uh, steam comes through here and ends up in this dome and condenses into water, goes to the bottom, makes the oil come up. Here's the sight glass. I'm missing one thing for it. There's a uh, drain screw here that happens to be a 5 16 coarse thread, so I'm going to make a just a, a little shutoff screw there for that. Um, and that's about it. Oh, I was going to tell you about the valving. Uh, uh, the valving is under this steam chest here. It's fairly similar to a steam engine, uh, except it has five ports instead of three. And uh, the reason it works is because there's a lot of lost motion. You know how we were chasing uh, some noises around in, in this engine here? Uh, because the slide valve was not tight between the setting screw uh, nuts and it was rattling in there. Well, in order to make this whole deal work with these duplex pumps, you have to have a lot of lost motion in the valve rod, between the valve rod and the, and the slide valve and it's built into it. It's, uh, there's a little block that moves a certain distance before it starts moving the valve one way or the other. And that's so that the piston on this side is at least halfway through its stroke before it starts actuating the valve to move the other side back that way. And you'll, you can see it when it's running. Now I've run this on compressed air and it, it runs okay. So I'm gonna assume it's gonna work okay on steam. The adjustment procedure is very simply is to put these uh, rods, I can't move it now, but these rods will move. You get them exactly in the middle of their stroke and then you set the valve so that it's in the middle of its stroke and everything should work fine. There is a more, much more complicated involved procedure to do that. but. Uh, uh, I'm going to try it the way it is. When you're watching these pumps work and you're thinking about what's going on, there is something that's happening here that you you might not be seeing. For one thing, there is it's not really like a steam engine where you have a flywheel uh, to carry in, uh, the stroke through with momentum and also there is no connecting rod to stop the piston before it gets to the end of the head. So, if the valving doesn't have something built into it to stop that, naturally it's going to slam into the ends of its stroke. Uh, so, if you remember from some of my earlier videos on this O&S engine here, we were talking about how the exhaust port closes a little bit before bottom dead center and it traps a little bit of steam in there to act like a cushion, the last small percentage of the stroke to, so that it cushions it and it it lets all the slack from all the mechanism, uh, doesn't let all the slack from all the mechanism uh, go in one direction and make a knock. So this valving is set up so that there is some compression on the end of the stroke to cushion it and keeping the piston from running into the head. Uh, 
So that all has to be built into it. cylinder cocks open because it wasn't cushioning it like I told you it was designed to do. got it pumping around in a circle. This is the input. It's not really a suction hose because it'll suck it flat, but it's sufficient for this test. And this is the output. And right now, it's primed up and it's pumping it around in a circle out of my feed motor barrel. That's quite a strain. See how the valves on one side is being actuated by the uh, piston rod of the other side. I don't know what that chirping is. I think it's maybe one packing gland is a little dry. finish up uh, and put the rest of the uh, detail on the piston rebuild in the next video uh, and uh, fitting it up uh, and uh, also the uh, 
governor pulley and the governor arrangement on the next video. So thanks a lot, and we'll see you next time.